Hi, everyone, and welcome to the National Council of Urban Indian Health's Peer-to-Peer -peer Solution Center, uh, UIO HIT Technical Assistance Support. My name is Tiffany Stark, and I am one of the Public Health Program Managers here at Nakui, and I will be your host today. Um, we want to thank you for volunteering your time to participate in today's discussion. We at Nakui appreciate your willingness to share your UIO's experiences with HIT and your EHRs. And we do understand that this could be a sensitive topic. Um, so this is a safe place and feel free to share as much as you feel sharing. And there are no right or wrong answers. We know everyone's in a different place with their capacity uh, in regards to HIT and EHRs. So this is a chance for all of us to learn from one another. And again, we're very pleased that you could join us today. Your feedback is very important and will allow us to further understand uh, your needs for HIT and EHR and how to better support them. If you do have any IT difficulty during today's call, please chat directly to comms and events and Lamar can assist you. And then also if you could, please enter in your name, UIO or external organization and any tribal affiliations into the chat box. That way we can get to know each other while also counting your attendance. And just a, a few housekeeping items. Uh, before we begin, we would like to review uh, the video capability uh, enabling your camera. This helps to create a more interactive environment. And also note that your microphones are muted, but you will have an opportunity um, to speak during the um, open discussion session. Um, have any answers or any questions to your, um, any answers for your questions, sorry. And raise your hand at the bottom if you'd like to be called on or just unmute if there is silence and pop in. And then our chat box will also be monitored. Uh, so please feel free to drop in any questions or comments throughout the presentation and we'll address them at the designated time. And also just note that this session will be recorded uh, for quality improvement purposes. Your answers will not be published and the information that you provide will be used to better support our UIOs. And also again, just a quick reminder for the evaluation. We do have the QR code on the screen uh, for your camera or um, the link will be also provided in the chat box. And a quick acknowledgement. So this project is supported by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention of the US Department of Health and Human Services as a part of financial assistance award totaling $100,000 with 100% funded by CDC and HHS. The contents are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of, nor an endorsement by CDC or HHS or the US government. And then for any uh, new folks that are joining us today, we'd like to provide a, a brief background on Nakui. So our organization is a national nonprofit devoted to the support and development of quality accessible and culturally competent health and public health services for American Indians, Alaska natives living in urban areas we represent uh, the 41 Title V UIOs under IHS and the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act. We strive to improve the health uh, of over 70% of the American India Alaska Native population that live in urban areas, supported by quality accessible healthcare centers. In our agenda today, uh, we're going to have a uh, lecture. Um, from James Spillane, our HIT SME, followed by an open discussion. And then we'll wrap up with uh, Nakui events that are upcoming, some funding op opportunities, and also the evaluation. Next slide, please. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Uh, so James Spillane is the CEO of Health IQ. He has extensive knowledge in uh, health IT and the electronic health records. Uh, so now I'll pass it to James. James? Nice. All right. All right. Let's go ahead and, yeah, it's good looking at that younger picture of me uh, before the gray hair kids and all that good stuff. Yeah. All right. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a little bit about uh, gamification is what, you know, the industry word is across, you know, across the board, not gaming as in casinos and stuff like that. And I'm going to kind of do like a pretty broad brush stroke about, you know, how it works and how to engage people. And, you know, for me, I really don't like to do anything unless it's fun. And then if it's not fun, I try to think of a way to make it fun. And I'll give you some examples of that. And we work in healthcare, which is sometimes can be a little bit mundane. And I'm going to talk about how to engage 
and not just you know not just users and, and staff, but also to engage you know patients in their healthcare and and how to put all those pieces together. All right, next slide. So one of the things is over the years we've you know whether it's from our parents, uh, if you've ever studied like nonviolent communication, there's use use of words that we use, and over the years these words kind of like came into the work culture, you know. And the negative side of that is like negative words, like, you know, you're playing the system or you're gaming the system. Uh, you're, you're just a player, you know, or you, you know, um, and these have negative, con like they, they mean negative things. And then work, we're always talking about like, oh man, I'm swamped. You know, it has these very negative, you know, these negative things too. Uh, so like we kind of are setting it all up to be negative, you know? Uh, and I want to talk about, let's not think that way. Let's, let's think about it all being fun. Um, and so we won't, we'll try to get, stay away from using these words, you know, uh, you know, that are negative in the workspace and then try to move it back towards more positive language. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So, so I'm going to talk about bridging the gap between fun and work and, and how to make work fun. All right, next slide. So first thing is, is we got to get simple. Um, you know, almost look at things from like a child's mindset and especially in healthcare and you guys will all nod your heads and shake your heads when I say this, we make everything more complex than it needs to be. Everything uh, to the littlest thing. We have meetings to have meetings, like a meeting to set up a meeting. Um, and I'm talking about simple concepts that we can get back to that will actually increase the engagement. And to do that, you have to understand that you have some key ingredients, right? They're, and we're gonna talk about that. The first key ingredient that we have is people. And then I'm gonna talk about adding fun and, and feedback to make it fun and to increase engagement. All right, next slide. So when I went to the Institute of Healthcare Improvement and um, there in Harvard, it's like on the campus. So I got to tell everyone I went to Harvard, which was fun. Um, we learned a couple of things from Dr. Deming. And one of the things was the appreciation of systems. So like understanding how, how complex our giant system is. Understanding variation. So understanding like this is how a system functions. These are, these are good operation parameters for that system. But you know, an outlier over here that comes in and does a complaint doesn't mean you have to change the whole entire system. So we will have outliers here and there, but it, we shouldn't jump to change the whole system. How to build knowledge. So how do we do lunch and learns? How do we spread knowledge? We're in this constant state of, um, we're always gonna be newbies now. We're always gonna be noobs as they say, because the whole system around us is constantly evolving and changing so fast that constant learning, lifelong learning is now just a part of the DNA of healthcare. But the thing that jumped out at me was they talked greatly about the human side of change. Um, so the human side of change is like when you change a system, it affects the people in that system radically. Next slide. So, so all of a sudden my mind's blown a little bit. We're learning about, oh, we're, we're, so, we're supposed to consider the humans, not just, you know, not just our patients, but the, but the actual people operating the system, the users of the system. So they started to talk about different types of people and how to message to those different types of people. So the first ones were blue, um, blue folks, which were altruistic and nursing, you know, are altruistic and nurturing. So when you look at nursing, you'll see a lot of people that are attracted to that. Uh, when you look at like, um, you know, behavioral health, this will be a lot in that realm, people who are attracted to that kind of thing. And you'll hear them say things like, uh, like words like, uh, I feel that, and you, those key words are indicators that when you approach this person, you gotta approach them from, from that level. All right, next slide. The other one is green, green analytical. So the green analytical folks are kind of more like your CFOs, your key con comp controllers, your folks that are very into the numbers, very like things to make sense mathematically, they line up, the stories need to be told linearly, like this happens, so this happens, this happens step by step. Uh, but as you know, we work in gray areas a lot in healthcare. Uh, next one would be uh, the next slide, which is red. So these are more of the uh, alpha type hard charging folks that um, 
So what they'll be is more kind of, sometimes they can be a bull in a china shop, but they're very action oriented and let's get things moving forward. So a lot of times when I work with different folks around the country, I'll see that they have a lot of, you know, ideas of what they want, or, you know, sometimes we say idea fairies. Uh, well, they'll have a lot of folks with ideas. We'll talk about what we want to do, uh, but we, we can't really get it going uh, because when we analyze it too much or overanalyze it, it looks a little, uh, you know, it looks like we find reasons why we can't do something. And so what I like to do is try to move people past fear into hope, right? And that's what we're trying to do here is move past fear and into hope and yes, we can kind of mentality. So if I see that happening, I'll try to insert somebody that's more action orientated onto the team and see if we can drive change. Okay, next slide. So first we got to understand that everybody's heart is in the right place, right? So what, what motivates people and what their intentions are, but what you see on the outside is what they're doing. And sometimes we can make wrong judgments about folks by, you know, just looking at what they're doing, right? But really, at the end of the day, they're probably trying to do, they have a good intention and they're trying to do something right. So I kind of want to put that in the back of you guys' mind that we're all in this together and we all have pretty good intentions. Next slide. So if we're going to talk about motivation being at the core, where does motivation come from? Next slide. So there's a lot of really good books out there that one could read, um, seductive interactive design, like how you can design things like in buildings or design things, you know, to move people to like, oh, I want to hit this button, uh, intuitive design. Uh, Connected talks about um, by Dr. Fowler. I was on, actually did a couple of talks with him, talks about how we're all interconnected. So we got to consider that, you know, as, as we move forward, everybody is connected. Uh, Reality is Broken is a gamification book. Uh, Nudge is a really good book. It talks about behavioral economics and how you can design things a certain way to get people to almost behave or nudge people to behave a certain way. And so a lot of the healthcare, I kind of look at how can we nudge people in the right direction? How can we nudge care teams? How can we nudge patients uh, into the right direction uh, using, you know, just the way signage is or something like that? Okay, next slide. So one of the really, really good books on this is called Drive by Daniel Pink. And I would recommend that you read it if you have, you know, a flight somewhere or you're like me, you're just flying around. So you end up reading a lot of books. Um, but in that book, he talks about three main things. Giving people purpose, giving them the autonomy to do something. And then from that, they get, they get basically mastery. They feel good about themselves. So you say, here's what we're trying to do. You come up a way to solve this solution. And then at, in that process, you'll build competency and, and you'll, be, you'll be happy. In 1974, they had a, they had a thing called self-determination theory, uh, which came out and it was all the rage at the time in psychology. And they had autonomy, competence, and relatedness. So those are the three main things that you kind of had to have uh, for, for that. Next slide. So here's, here's the last one I would, I would talk about. Uh, it's called the Tom Sawyer effect. If any one of you guys know what this is or have heard of this before, you know, put a thumbs up and, or wave your hand or whatever. But basically, it's for, for some people, much of what we do all day consists of these routine, not terribly captivating tasks. And in these situations, it's best to try to unleash the positive side of the Sawyer effect. I got the emojis coming through right now. This is gamification, see? Uh, so the positive side of the, of the four effect, by attempting to turn work into play and increase the task variety to make it more like a game or use, use it to help master other skills. So can you guys hear me okay? I'm in a, I'm in a lobby here, so it's, it can be a little loud. So, okay, so next slide. All right, so now let's take what he said about making it more like a game, right? So if you go back to like the early games like, you know, Pong, and if you go back to like Atari and stuff like that, uh, they were kind of using this working thing that said like, all right, what do we need to create a good game? Besides game mechanics, what do we need? Well, we need autonomy, mastery, purpose, a sense of somebody feeling competent, 
something social and relatedness to it, like a, a high score sheet where you could see you put your three initials in at the top. But most important thing that we need to have is feedback loops, right? And that's what games give you. You see how much you have left. You see what your score is. You know what the high score is. You're trying to beat the high score. You see how many extra lives you have. There's all these multiple stimuli coming back to you. And, you know, I started to think, how can we incorporate this into healthcare? So I'm going to show you some examples of games and how that works. And I'm going to talk about feedback. So that's the feedback's in green for a reason. All right, next slide. So if you would have noticed earlier those two theories, if you put them all together, the only one that was missing was feedback. Those were both those theories together. So the process of game thinking and game mechanics to solve, to, to engage users to solve problems. So, well, we got a lot of problems in healthcare. So could we hence apply gamification to healthcare? Yes, we certainly can. Okay, next slide. So this is really weird. This is like, this is right in the beginning when uh, the iPhone kind of came out and immediately one of the most popular games was Farmville. Uh, farming, cultivating crops. Uh, Zenga came out with another game the year later, uh, and it was called Dine and Dash. And they had so much success with that. I think they made like, out of those two games, they made a billion dollars. Uh, they created Diaper Dash. And then another one came out about 2000 or 2007, 2008 called Flight Control. And you basically were an air traffic controller trying to land planes. Uh, so I want you to think about this. Cultivating crops, waiting tables, changing diapers, and the career with the highest suicide rate were the number one played games on the iPhone back then. Next. So what it is, is it's the mechanics of the game and not the theme that, that make it fun, make it engaging. Next slide. So I'm going to talk about some of these mechanics, and I'm going to talk about uh, how you could apply them to your healthcare setting. So the first one is achievement. There's 52 altogether that you could apply. And I can give you the whole card deck if you guys want what it looks like. But the first one's achievement. You have to have things that people achieve. So, hey, we, got, we met all our Gipper measures. We got an award for meeting all of our Gipper measures. We got certified as a patient-centered medical home by the Joint Commission. And we passed our NCQA. Uh, the other one is real time uh, versus delayed mechanics. So there's war. So you know you got you're going to get an award here if you do well. You're going to get rewarded. But during the process of playing the game, there's awards along the way that you can get. Countdown. We have a lot of countdowns, right? Uh, Gipper itself is a countdown. You have until uh, the end of September, you know that October first cutoff to meet all your Gipper measures. So we already have these things kind of built in in our systems, but we're not using them properly. Next slide. Here's another one, progression. So, you, so you'll see later that I have slides that kind of show, hey, we're progressing, we're getting better. And you know this in the business as run charts is one way to look at it. Loyalty, you can create different types of loyalty. You can create loyalty within your own organization multiple times. Um, so you can say, here's how well care team you know, purple is doing, here's how well care team gold is doing, here's how a outpatient is doing uh, versus this clinic over here is outpatient. Here's how we, we're doing uh, compared to Fort Defiance to Gila River. Here's how we're doing, so you can just expand this out, this loyalty and drive engagement. The other one is epic meeting. We're in healthcare. I mean, we have some of the most epic meaning already. We're trying to save lives. We're trying to prevent disease. We've already have this embedded. Now the trick is how do we harvest this and create these feedback loops to get this out to the rest of the folks. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk about the common traits of just a game. So we already know what drives the game and what you need to do to, and motivate the game. Now we're gonna talk about what they all have in common. They have a goal, they have rules because otherwise people will break the rules. And you know, try to cheat the system. They have feedback systems and then their voluntary participation. So, I mean, technically you could say at the end tomorrow, you can go get a job someplace else or you can quit or whatever. But at the end of the day, we're all doing this 
because we care about healthcare and we want to be here and we want to make the world a better place. That's our core being, our vocation. Next slide. So this is a really important concept and we're not the greatest at it in healthcare. And I think we can get a lot better, but if you look at your phone right now, there's probably eight things telling you, giving you feedback loops. I have a notification. I mean, those notifications that are on there on Facebook and on Instagram or whatever are some of the most behaviorally addictive things out there. They are designed for a reason. They come from the gaming industry. They brought it into Gamify, their platforms. But when you see that little red heart or you see that little red notification, you can't help but click on that. So that information led to an action. So here's a simple thing. If you're out of gas and you're driving down the road and you look down, you're getting feedback. You're getting feedback how fast you're going. You're getting feedback of how slippery the roads are. What is the current temperature? Uh, oh, I'm empty on gas. My, that information leads to action. That information drives change. Next slide. So I'll give you two examples how just, just looking at the IHS EHR, and I can show it to you, and NextGen, I can show it to you, and Cerner, I can show it to you, any EHR you want to mess with. Uh, I'll give you examples of how there's game mechanics already embedded, uh, embedded in creating these feedback loops. So next. So in our electronic health record right now in most of Indian country, we have a clock, right? And that clock, it's very, you know, that book nudge I was talking about, that clock, people want to keep that clock blue. When that clock turns red, that means that the patient is due for something. So next slide, they'll go ahead and click on that clock and find out what they're due for. And I have providers that I work with that obsess about having a perfect score on this, like in terms of like, I want my clocks to be clean, I want it to be blue. And so much so that this creates like secondary and tertiary feedback loops in terms of if it's telling me that something's broken because they'll come back and they'll say, I did a pap, James, and it's still red on this patient. Why isn't it? And then I'll find out that they changed the CPT code and I need to change it in the back end. So we at, now we're talking about multiple feedback loops within a system to improve the quality of the system and better the care. Next slide. The other one they have is eye care, which is a tremendous tool where they can go in and they can just look at a whole entire patient population of their panel. So they impanel, you know, a thousand patients to them and they can say, all right, for fun, I'm gonna go to colorectal cancer and I'm gonna sort for no, and I wanna know all of the patients who are due for a colorectal cancer screening because it's, it's Cancer Awareness Month and we gotta start handling this. Next slide. Thirdly, what they're doing, and I don't know if you saw that last one, but there was like actually a little envelope and an Excel spreadsheet that they could export to mail merge and it will actually send out letters to all those people, which is really cool. And that's one thing you're gonna want in your EHRs as you move forward is can you do it? The other one they have is National Aggregated that's built into eye care. So they can go in and they can see what their numbers are in real time. So this is an example of, we just took a small population just so it pull up quick. But if I was a primary care provider, I can quickly look at all the patients on my panel. So the other one was by name. This is by numerator denominator. So I can tell real quick, where am I at? So I'm doing really good at my BMIs. I'm doing really good at my alcohol screens. I'm really, and then I'm like, whoa, but, but, Maybe I'm not so good at when they test positive, what am I doing? You know, am I doing the ESPERT? Am I doing a screening for brief intervention and referral for treatment? That's an education code, by the way. This is a feedback loop for me to dig deeper and to sleuth out where I need to get better as a provider or as a care team. Next slide. So here's one that I recently just took. So I can start to look at this and I can, just looking at this, I'm getting feedback, right? So I'm already knowing, like, without guessing, that let, let's look at this right here. Let me guess, you don't really provide dental services or you have a, you're contracting out or are they coming here once a month? What is going on here? Because you're meeting all the measures for all the other measures. You're doing good at your cancer screening measures. You're over 50% for screening for colorectal, pap, mammo. 
Uh, but when I look over here, your dental measures are not really all that great. So we probably want to look at maybe designing our healthcare system or maybe hiring a contractor to come twice a month rather than once a month. The other one is, is something's broken with your immunizations. I mean, I'm pretty sure you're giving all these shots. You just are used to this. What is going on there? How are we entering this? Are we putting it into a note or are we actually doing the immunization and adding the medicine, et cetera? So this is a feedback loop that is leading to change and leading to action and engagement in your own healthcare system. But if people can't see these things, they don't know what they need to change. And instead they get to the end of the year and they're told they're doing this wrong, this wrong, and this wrong. So let's not be that. Let's create these dynamic uh, feedback loops that everyone can see and adjust along the way and adapt. Next slide. So here's another one. Here's a site that's performing really well. Just what, what do you think is going on here? What number is red here? So me as an approved advisor, I can look at this and I know exactly what's happening. They probably have a mammo van. The mammo van's probably coming there, doing the mammos. They're probably putting on an Excel spreadsheet and it's not getting entered back into the electronic health record with a CPT code. Because why else would you be good at everything in your healthcare system except that? So sure enough, I got the feedback to see this. We went down, we corrected that, and now they're at 65% because they had them all done. We just had to put them in. Next slide. So now we're gonna talk about, okay, well, that's great for you, James. That's great for you know, you know, the admin staff and stuff like that, but how do we start to bring it out to the people? All right, next slide. So we're gonna talk about scorecards. So you have to have something that's pretty dynamic and goes out pretty regularly or totally dynamic where they can just go look at it and they can see, oh, I did five apps today. Oh, and it definitely showed up here. So here's a, here's a site. Uh, I think this is Manilik, it says at the top, I'm not sure. But they basically created a scorecard, and that scorecard is these are where we're, these are all the ones that we're meeting, and these are the ones we're not meeting. So we knew right then and there that they were going to meet all of their Gipper measures that year, but they were going for uh, they were going for a higher certification. So those numbers on the bottom, you see where they're at? They're at a they're at a higher level. So they're trying to meet those measures down there. So they know they're going to meet all their Gipper measures. Now they're focusing on the ones down low. Next slide. And that's HEDIS, by the way. They're looking at HEDIS. Okay. So now, not, you know, not being a, not being a brain surgeon, you can kind of look at this and tell, okay, what do we need to do uh, to meet this, all 21 of our GIPRA measures? And so I will tell you right now, at this place, they were so engaged in meeting that measure that in the family practice primary care, a doctor would go into the room, see that the red clock, the kid was due for, debt, for a sealant, and then would walk the kid down to the dentist and say, hey, schedule this kid for appointment. He needs sealants. That's engagement. When you have people looking at these numbers, getting the feedback, and then they went on to meet all their, I, I would hate to be the dentist here because that guy probably had a lot of pressure <laughs> to do all these sealants. But at the end of the day, it was a really beautiful thing to watch them all work together to meet all 21 of their GIPRA measures. Next slide. You can have fun with it. You can try different tools out. Uh, you can send something like this out to the care teams. Like, these are, this is all you need to do to meet the measure. If you just do this many more, you'll meet it. Next slide. Um, one of the first versions I've seen in this uh, was this was like in 2006 where I was looking at Weight Watchers and I'm like, oh my gosh, these guys are all about game mechanics and introducing it into their Weight Watchers app. So they had not only, you know, you'll see the run chart in a second, but you would punch in goals and stuff and then they would show you how well you're doing. But they had this whole other level where you're like, dude, I just need to drink like four more waters and I'll meet the measure. I just need some milks. I need to eat more vegetables. Well, what is that doing? That's helping you lose weight because you're not eating junk food, right? So you're trying to hit all these ticks uh, and inside, inside the game. So this is a game within the game. All right, next slide. And then, uh, so now you all know how much I weigh. Uh, so this is, uh, this, is for, this is for science, guys, science. So, uh, so here we are. And then remember I was talking about the game within the game and um, delayed, delayed rewards versus long-term rewards. 
So I'm trying to get to a weight and it's rewarding me every time I get to a certain number. So I'm getting a star for being five pounds, a star for 5% until eventually I meet my, my, my goal. And when I meet my goal, I get the big award and then get the, which means I just get to set another goal. So next slide, but I'm engaged. So now if we take what we spoke about weeks prior and months prior about how do you use policy and how do you use system design and how do you automate your EHRs? And now that final piece is now we put the pieces of the puzzle together. And then how, once we put all those pieces of puzzle together, how do we create that engagement and those feedback loops to show people that, hey, all these things are starting to work and that should drive motivation and drive engagement in your organization. So we did. We did do all those things and we did put them all together. And then soon we were publishing and we could see poignantly that there were huge jumps in our measures once we started to deploy all of these things simultaneously. So it's like a million little things you got to do, but they all add up over time to, to have great impact in the healthcare system. Next slide. So one of the things I want to talk about, and this is kind of when you start to think about how do we do this, what does it look like? You got to have an idea of what the quality improvement framework looks like. So you have to say, what are we trying to prove? And the very next one is, what are we going to measure? Because that information leads to what you are going to change. And so you plan what you're going to do, you do it, you study it, and then you act on that new information and you complete the cycle. And eventually you'll get change in your system. Next slide. So in Alaska, we had a problem. So if you look at the Aleutians and the bottom left, uh, I was working with clinics out there and they had 63% tobacco use rate. These are horrible rates. And we already knew that we were having issues with tobacco. So they hired me to come in and say like, well, how can we improve this? How can we get, that's, we'll start with tobacco cessation counseling and getting folks into tobacco cessation. So I will show you, next slide. We did feedback tests and we staggered them in different months to improve the measures. So here you can see we were doing flu first. So flu, we started sending, here's all the patients who are coming in, here's who's due for their flu shot, here's how many more you need to make it, and boom, you see an increase in the system. Uh, a month, month, two months later, we did the tobacco, huge jump. Uh, the month later after that, we did FAS and DV together, because uh, those are both screens that are in your bundle. And then finally, we just use depression because depression is your whole population. So that's our control. We can see that when we deployed these feedback loops, it, it, it was represented right here. So next slide. So here is an example of what the tobacco one looked like. So first, we told the directors we were going to do this. So we had a slight bump. Then we sent lists to the clinic directors saying, here's what we're getting ready to do. Then we sent the providers list of the patients that were due with graphs showing them like, here's how, you know, here's how many more. So they were showing them like this and there's a target line that goes straight across. And we're like, you just need to get to there and you meet it. And oh, by the way, then we finally sent them one saying, this is how many more you need to meet the measure. So knowing that your percentile isn't good enough, but knowing that you only need eight more patients. And so within a matter of January 15th to ja January 30th, they met this measure. And that was all done by giving them feedback. Well, of course they had to do the educations. Next slide. But we were, in, we, were, we were creating drive and engagement in the system. So here we go from year to year, you could see that starting to put all these pieces of the puzzle together, like changing our policies, changing our care team design, changing our system design, optimizing the EHR, and then giving people the feedback they needed, we were able to increase domestic violence screening rates from basically 10% to they're at 90% now. Next slide. Same with fetal alcohol screening. Next slide. And then you, I don't want to put every slide for every single thing we did, but you could see that if we looked at 2011 to 2012, there's a big difference in our numbers here. So, wow, this really does work. Why, don't, why haven't we been doing this for years? Next slide. So when I first 
approached my wife and I was, I was going to Orlando or something to give this talk on gamification and feedback and engagement and all that stuff. Uh, and she's really smart. You know, she's got, like I always joke around, she's got more degrees than a thermometer. Uh, I asked her what she thought and she said it perfectly well. She said, when feedback is specific, personal and progress orientated, it increases engagement and enjoyment while improving patient care. So I couldn't say that better and I just leave that on there. All right, next slide. And then this is what I had before. It comes back to the human experience. Complex systems have simple leverage points, relationships, fun, work and play might be a matter of perception and engagement. So you can see why she's smarter than me just by what I had down and then what she said. All right, next slide. So I'm gonna talk uh, about the pyramid of things real quick because sometimes we'll be stuck in the bottom part of the pyramid and we're trying to get to the pleasurable and meaningful part. And so when we look at things at experience and you're gonna tackle these kind of things, one of the first things we wanna do is make sure, okay, we have a functional, reliable and usable uh, healthcare system and platform. If not, we need to work on that. And that's kind of what we worked on in those beginning presentations where we were talking about policy, system design, EHRs. What we're really talking about is this lower half of getting a functioning, good policies, good EHR, good care team designs, good system designs. So you can get to the promised land, which is pleasurable and meaningful actual healthcare change. Next slide. So that's all I have. I think I did. Did I speak in perfectly with my time or would, did I go over? I don't know. You did great. <laughs> awesome. Yes, thank you, James. Thank you for the awesome presentation. Um, so now we want to open up the floor to any questions that anybody has for James and the material that he presented on. Um, and I do have one to start because um, you kind of mentioned that outlook of, you know, oh, I'm swamped, like I can't, you know, do yeah. that. So what's your um, suggestion or recommendation um, in trying to get things a bit more fun at work to then obviously help improve the outcomes uh, with our work? Yeah, um, that's really, really, really good. Uh, it's It's really weird. Um, I don't know if you just listen to people in the hallway and at the water cooler and all that, the way they talk is like, they're super busy, they're super swamped, they're all this stuff. And they use a lot of these really negative words. Like we're, language wise, we're, it's very interesting. Like, I just saw this thing the other day that said, stop using these words and start using these words. And like, we use weird words like, knock it out you know, knock it out of the park. Like, that's such a violent, you know, combative word. Like, why, why don't we say, like, do a good job? Like, <laughs> do your best, you know? But instead we say, you know, crush it. Like, crush what? Who, who are we crushing? What are we crushing? Like, and so, so the way around that is there's actually people and there's actually, I could show you slide decks on that. Like, say this and don't say that. Let's move it more to a positive language and, and, and then train staff on that. And they'll start to realize like you're killing it, right? Maybe you shouldn't say that in a healthcare set, set, you know, place. Like you're killing it. You know, two birds with one stone. No, 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 no. We, we, so training, just train them on it. And that's what I was talking about, like nonviolent communication. In in elementary schools, they have whole classes that they work with teachers on. Here's the better way to say something than the way that we've been saying it for like the last 30, 40 years. Right. Here's the here's the more here's how you're gonna get an you know an eight-year-old to listen to you better if you frame it this way. It's nonviolent. It's more like, hey, I think we can solve this together. That's way better than you know pointing out something that they do wrong. Um, so yeah, I would say training is the number one way of just being conscious and aware of what you're saying. And now I know you all are gonna listen, go back and listen now, and you're gonna hear these words. You're gonna hear them. Watch. Once you, once you hear it once, you can't unhear it. So, okay. Thanks, James. Um, yeah. And then I do see that we have Mr. Galvez. Uh, he has his hand up. So if you want to take it away. Yes, hi. Thanks, Tiffany. James, thank you so much for that presentation. I totally agree with your, with your perspective and, and the slides. In fact, uh, when you were on your slide with uh, 
Daniel Pink and his book. That's one of the books we issue out to our leadership here. I was just curious, and we've done three three books in the last three years where we work on, you know, just like the emotional intelligence with Travis uh, Bradbury and Gene uh, Greaves. I don't know if you've ever used emotional intelligence 2.0 for some of that training stuff. Um, and then we've also passed out like the high performance habits with Brendan Burchard. I think he's really great. He's really awesome. His book is very easy to read. It's sort of similar to the Daniel King's drive book. Um, we, we were looking to rolling out the Myers-Briggs, uh, personality test, which I think, um, you alluded to some of those, I think they kind of cross and over into Myers-Briggs. Um, although, although. Some of the points you made were from different sources. And I'm just curious if you've ever used Meyer Briggs uh, personality test to, to like um, pair it with some of these training mechanisms to sort of allow folks to really understand the various personality types. I know Meyer Briggs is a little more academic in nature and it really focuses on cognitive functions and it's sort of kind of like the psychological, the school of psychology. So. Um, but, you know, in healthcare, we're dealing with personalities all the time. So I'm a big, like, sort of believer of really u- utilizing these tools. The more tools we offer our leadership team, the, I think the better we're more aware of, you know, yeah. catching, catching who's who and identifying, you know, where they're coming from. Because I think uh, when we deal with personality types, you know, obviously, um, in, even in healthcare, you have folks that are more analytic, you have folks that are, um, more assertive and you have, you know, doctors, nurses, medical assistants, uh, differ from say behavioral health specialists, licensed clinical social workers, psychologists, but at the end of it all, we're here all for that same purpose we were talking about. So, um, thanks again. Yeah. Yeah. I would recommend one book to you, uh, one book to you in leadership is the journey beyond fear is a great book that I literally just read for the second time before I came here. So I was on the plane and reread the whole book and like highlighting the heck out of it. And, uh, that was a really good one. And, and the other thing too, is I noticed like around, I would say 2010, they started moving away from uh, the Brig Myers and they started moving towards this thing called the big five. And what the big five really focuses a little bit more on. And that's kind of like the new standard. Uh, I, I, I've gone to multiple places where they're doing this. And what, it, what it's really focusing on is like, how will it, how open-minded, is, open-minded are you? Or are you closed-minded? Are you out, you know, outgoing? Are you more stick to yourself? Like more of these things that are a little deeper rooted mm-hmm. in, our, in our behaviors. And it is good to know like, oh yeah, that, that that dude's totally outgoing and he's that way, but that person's more introverted, you know, and they're more, you know, this way. It, 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 so it's called the big five. Okay. And you can, yeah, literally just Google it on your phone or whatever, and you'll see, and you could just start the process. So, but That's yeah, awesome. it kind of, yeah. And it also can kind of lead you to like, oh, this pill, this person's willing to try to change, but if we, but if we, this person wants to be a little safer, you know, I see people yeah. smiling on here. So, but, uh, <laughs> Well, the, the challenge that I have found is that folks come with the, the sort of uh, point of view that, you know, I should be myself and I should be me and people should accept me that way. But in organizations, for organizations to function, it's almost like you got to yeah. give up a little of yourself and try on something different so that it makes it for a much better cohesive uh, teamwork and, and, and also for a more a much better uh, organization because yeah. I have found, you know, like even I was thinking of passing out The Power of Habit but with uh, Charles Duhigg. And that's a really good book. And it just talks about the nature of habit and how, you know, we're, we're designed so different, but can we create new habits to really, and that's where like the gaming systems, um, they're very good at that, right? They're creating new behaviors based on all of these little small um, tokenization, reliance, e-learning management system uses um, awards for com- completing, you know, certain training modules and certain amount of training. So um, I think that it's so vast, like from the leadership point of view, like how do we, I mean, I'm doing it once a year with small and then focus yeah. on quarterly, you know, to make it more, more bite size, if you will, to, to yeah. be able to complete some of these things. 
Well, yeah, there was a book written by, well, I forget who wrote the book, but it's about Alan Mulally. He was the guy who was the head of Boeing and the guy, and then he came over to help refix four. So he fixed Boeing, brought him over. And one of the things he did is he talked about this, like, not just, you know, well, accountability, of course, that's what we're doing. We're, we're losing $5 billion every two weeks. We need some accountability here. What are we messing up and what do we need to improve? But he did this thing called a weekly business meeting and you had a red, yellow, and green of where you were at on your problems, right? And right. when he started doing, the, yeah, when he started doing these meetings, like, all right, Charles, you've been yellow over here for two weeks. What's going on with the European division? And they were so separated and siloed that he's like, all right, we can't do this anymore. We're losing too much money. And then finally, one person speaks out and, from Canada and says, we had that same problem. This is how you fix it. And then all of a sudden, it went from a culture of silos to a culture of togetherness. Meg Wheatley wrote a book called The New Science, and it was basically education-based, and it came out like 20 years ago, and it blew everybody in education's mind. And the book was basically saying, you got to think of organizations no longer as this top-down structure, but of a biological network. If you do something over here, it affects everything in that system. It's like if you chop a branch off a tree, it's affecting the whole tree, you know? Mm -hmm. And we do that. We move people in and out of positions. We fire people. We hire people. And we got to understand that that system is biological, like, in nature. It affects everything in it. And that's the human side of change. So long story short is I would recommend more meetings focusing on those kind of things because we kind of sweep all that stuff under the rug and just go to what's the problem and blah, blah, blah. And we might want to start to look at more. Let's carve out time for improvement. Let's carve out time for these books. Let's carve out time for quality, you know, stuff like that. So I would increase it. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Very helpful. Yeah, yeah thank you for your feedback too. I got, I stole some stuff from you too. We got to share, right? That's the whole, we, we, we have exactly. so much limited resources in Indian country. We just got to share everything we know with everybody. Yeah, that was amazing. Um, and then we do have a comment in the chat from Evie. She said, we operate in such a complex healthcare system intertwined with complex human beings for sure. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, and that's why it calls for a lot of this. Like this is why it calls for the patient center medical home and all this stuff, because we, we need tools to help us because otherwise, you know, what's, here's some other negative words, we're drowning, <laughs> you know, drowning in complexity. So we need to think of ways to make things simpler and work smarter and not harder. Exactly. Keeping yeah. things simple. Yeah. yeah and maybe, definitely maybe. having the better outlook. Yeah. Yeah. I like to say, someone asked me the other day, what do you do? And I go, I, I kind of try to far as gump stuff. Like I try to just be, I try to make it more Forrest Gumpy or more like a, more like a six-year-old would look at it. Like, well, why don't you just do this? They, nine times out of 10, they're giving you the right answer. If you explain something at a dinner table to like an eight-year-old, they'll give you a better answer than if you sit in a room of, you know, all of us talking about stuff, then we'll have, we'll make it over complex in two seconds. We'll overdo it. And they'll be like, For well, sure. why don't you just do this? So. <laughs> Definitely so. good points. Uh, any other questions or comments? Definitely feel free to come off mute or put it in the chat. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> the, other, the other one is like, uh, I, was, I should have said this when I was talking about it, but this is good for leadership. And I spoke before about this in the other one. But when you watch really good leaders, they're hitting all those traits of people when they say a sentence and like, I remember just learning that and then watching like Obama or somebody speak and they were like, they said it like they nailed it out perfectly in the same order I had it in. They're like, and they were like, talk, he was talking about like an old lady in Ohio and he's like, you know, Irene in Ohio is trying to live off of a thousand dollars a month and on social security, but we know that that's not enough. And she's not, you know, like this old lady, 80 year old lady. But if we do this at 5% per, and now all the, uh, you can see all the nurturing people pick up. They're like, wait, what's this guy saying? And then he would go into the set next sentence about laying it out mathematically. Like with a simple 5% from so-and-so, we could increase that to 2,000 over the next two years, you know, without dipping into the, you know, 
And then all the analytic people are like, yeah, 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 that's right. And then he says, and if, you know, this is America, this is the land of hope. If we can land on the moon, we could do this by golly. And you're like, and then all the reds are like, yeah, I like, so the message there is when you frame anything that you're trying to do, try to at least in your head think, how do I attach emotionally, numerically, or, you know, you know, something that the greens will like, and then how do I do a rah-rah at the end? And if you do that, you're going to reach your room and get greater engagement without a doubt. So you'll just, there'll be better buy-in, put it that way, at least. Yeah, definitely. Thanks so much. Um, and we can proceed with the next slide. Uh, we'll definitely keep an eye out for any other questions or comments. Um, but we did want to mention, um, or highlight, I should say, uh, the Nakui TA request. You can always submit a request to have a one-on-one -on -one, um, session for HIT or EHR uh, questions or challenges. Um, so that's always a resource. Uh, so nakui.org slash uh, TA. And Micah also put that in the chat. So thank you, Micah. Next slide. Uh, and then we also wanted to mention some of our uh, upcoming events here at Nakui. Um, so we do have a uh, info session for the ECR opportunity on the 23rd of this month, so this Thursday. Uh, March 1st, we have a Peer-to-Peer -peer Solution Center um, for Nakui Resources. Uh, March 14th, we have Rooted in Resilience, Urban Indian Harm Reduction for HIV Prevention. March 16th, Reflections on Burnout and IPC uh, at UIOs, a storytelling approach. And April 12th, we have Growing Strong Together, creating um, inclusive healthcare services. And then also uh, May 15th through May 18th, we have our uh, 2023 annual conference. And I did wanna mention one more um, event that we didn't have on the slide, my apologies, but it's definitely a, um, a good resource on February 28th. There's going to be a national GIPRO webinar, uh, so GIPRO 101 training, um, and we'll have that link in the chat box as well as our follow-up email as well. And then for Nakui funding opportunities, as mentioned, for this Thursday with that info session for your ECR, we do have um, one more spot available um, for an award up to 84600 uh, so definitely take a look at that application. Um, it is definitely preferred for EPIC EHRs um, or eClinical Works, um, but definitely worth uh, taking a look at that for more information. And then definitely, um, if you could, please take some time to fill out the evaluation on this session. Your feedback is truly important um, in you know, bettering the work that we do to help you with your work as well. Um, so definitely take a look at that. We have the QR code pulled up for your phone, um, or you could uh, utilize the link that's provided in the chat. But again, we want to thank you for your time. Um, and thank you, James, for your wonderful presentation. Um, we truly appreciate all the feedback from today's session. So thanks, everyone. And I hope you have a great day.